Live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world, you are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Nahum Klegman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 42 of the From Entrepreneur. Today, I have another incredible guest. I'm super excited about this episode. I've been wanting to hear his story and uh, continue to be inspired by him for many, many years. I'm very proud and excited to welcome Ira Zlotowicz from Eastern Union Funding to the show. Ira, are you there? Yes, how are you? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking uh, your busy schedule to join with us today. I'm uh, definitely excited about it and looking forward uh, to having you uh, join us. So just briefly, just to get started, for those that don't know, what is Eastern Union Funding? Eastern Union is a commercial mortgage broker. We basically are, to, in using some uh, Jewish words thrown in, we're basically a shotgun service between commercial real estate owners and banks. When a commercial real estate owner is looking for a mortgage, he may have a relationship with one or two or three banks. He may know of other banks, but it's our relationship and know how to leverage that relationship and know how to get them the best deal and details of a deal, not just the rate, and, but the terms and the details and some business terms throughout the whole entire process. Okay, so it's, it's basically a shotgun survey and, and strictly commercial? Commercial is defined, yes. Commercial is defined as everything but a one to four family house. So an apartment building is called commercial, construction okay. commercial as well. Okay, so so you, you actually have the relationships with the banks, you have the relationships with the property owners, and you, so as you said, you make the shit up and try to put the best deal together. Correct. So we primarily focus on building relationships with more and more lenders, and then we go out and and find owners that are looking for loans and then build relationships with them. But it's, it's, really, it's really leveraging the relationships that I have with the, with the lenders to be able to get done what the clients need done. So our focus I is see. a client comes to us and says, I have this situation and we'll find one of our lenders to get it done. Meaning someone that, and a lender could be a bank or it could be a pro- not just a bank? It well, the, the, it's a very broad term. So if someone has a, is looking for a loan on a property that um, doesn't have any tenants yet, and right. they might not be able to get a regular bank, a conventional bank. There might be private lenders. But a lender is defined as, again, in the broad term, being a shotgun is anyone that's willing to lend money or any institution. And relevant to how you, like now there's a thing called crowdfunding. So sometimes there's right. loans through crowdfunding as well. Right, right. Excellent. Are you actually into crowdfunding? Have you looked into that for your uh, industry? We did look into it. We're actually in the process of building out a, an equity. We have an equity division that we also help people raise equity for people. That's one of the things I was going to get to is that our core business is, is we're a shotgun. So someone's buying a piece of property, we don't help them find the property. So we're not in the brokerage business to buy and sell real estate. But if they're looking right. to buy, we get them the debt, the mortgage. We also expanded our services over the last couple of years to start getting, finding them investors to help them invest with their property in their properties. And in that universe, we're, as we're working, and some of the things we'll discuss, I guess, regarding the technologies we're building on, is will allow us the ability to come a few steps closer to actually doing crowdfunding. So as the, since the law has changed, so someone could, could be interested in putting $100,000 into a deal, real estate deal of 50000 or 20000 and typically they wouldn't be able to get access to deals, or if the person was looking to take money, wouldn't want to take from so many different people. But through crowdfunding, we're going to be able to pull those investors together and provide to one of our borrowers, you're buying a building for $10 million, we'll get you a loan for $8 million, and of the other $2 million, we'll help you put together the money as well. And with that, we're going to look towards crowdfunding. That's fantastic. And that's because of the Jobs Act that passed that enables uh, other people to invest now in these type of deals? It makes it much easier for others to invest. Until now, it was limited to just to qualified investors. Now, right. it's, uh, it made it a lot broader. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you guys are really on top of your game. Okay, I want to definitely uh, dig in deeper. But uh, before we do, I want to hear a little bit more about Iro. Where are you from? Where you grew up? You know, what schools you went to? So let's talk about that a bit. I'm not sure if I really grew up yet. <laughs> uh, we're in the process trying. So um, I, I was I, I was born and lived, grew up in uh, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. I went to the to Mir Yeshiva and and then I went to, to high school. I went to Yeshiva for Akwe. And okay. then I went to Eretz Yisrael the Rift to Leiv Avram. Leiv Avram, where that's, that's in Yerushalayim. In... Wasn't Yerushalayim, but Weinfeld is Rosh Hashiva. Beautiful, beautiful. And then you said you were there for two years. There for two years, and then uh, and so what? Yeah, I came back. I got married. Uh, I got married young. I got married at twenty, and nice. um, just celebrated the twentieth anniversary. Mazel Tov, twentieth! Wow. And um, how many kids do you have? I'm three Kanaanahara and one Foster boy. Have one. Beautiful! Wow, beautiful Kolkavod. It's amazing. Okay, so you got married. So you got married in New York, and where were you living since you were married? And then, for the, for the most part of my marriage, and I've been living in Lakewood, New Jersey. 
Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I have a lot of great friends with there. Love Lakewood, obviously. Yeah. So let's let's talk about so what happened when you got married? What were you in Colel? Did you how did how did everything get started? Where how did we get to where we are today? So the real the, the little bit of a backstory is is that I always had this business plan written up from when I was in uh, Yeshiva to actually open up a business called Klishim. And the Klishim is the is the is really the acronym. Not really an acronym. An acronym is based on almost one letter at a time. But the acronym for cleaners, shoe repair, and film developing. And it's the only three things. Well, now there's no more film developing anymore. But it's the only three things that people drop off and pick up in their life. Everything else you buy and dispose of. And right. these are the only three items you drop off and pick up. It's also the only three items. If you did a survey of 100 of your friends and neighbors, and you ask them where they go shopping for different items, about 80% will give the same answer. And then 20% will be stragglers of different answers. When it comes to these items, no one has a go-to place. There's no place that they trust and they love and they, they deal with. And the same way Starbucks reinvented you know, the whole coffee experience, that was my idea to reinvent this part of the experience. So I always had this business idea to, uh, to do that. I still have the plan. You know, I'm probably going to still <laughs> open it one day. But um, <laughs> that didn't happen. I went to, so when I got married, I went to Cole. I was there in Cole for about 11 months. Which Cole? Um, I was in uh, BMG. MG, okay. And there's the, right, I guess right, Lakewood like, right. makes sense. So I went to, to BMG. And then that's what... Uh, so this plan you had before you got married? This plan like, I had before was... I got married. I, I, I wow. wrote this plan out. So you're always was... entrepreneurial. You always had a business head. Yeah, I always, uh, I always try to do different things through Yeshiva to come up with different uh, businesses and things like that. You know, just that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when I started, the earlier things I started was... Uh, but when I was in Yeshiva, I, gave mo- I did most of the projects on behalf of, with, of, of its Sadaka. So if I ran a carnival, mm-hmm. if I ran a, a food for selling food in Shiva, I did all these things through. Uh, and you typically, the, in most cases, they were on behalf of a tzedakah organization. Right. But you were always very entrepreneurial, looking, making the sale and uh, marketing and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. So the, all, the only thing I did while I was, at, while I was in Bachar, before I, before I got married, I started a learning program. I was 19. I started a learning program, which is still running Baruch Shem till today. And I tried oh, wow. a big schuss of, of the Hatzlacha to that learning program, which is uh, called Masmid Gavoa. So there's a little over, so okay. over 3,000 um, 3, kids a year, 6th and 7th grade. And the, wow. and the uniqueness of the program is that it motivates a kid, it motivates a kid to learn every night in Chazar what they learned in Yeshiva. And such a great idea. So I was in third, when I was in third grade, I was in Torah Semis. I had Rabbi Josh Silverman as my uh, Rebbe. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was in Camp Monk, and I, I, I started the program, and I made it Lezech Nishmas, Josh Silvmans, Rabbi Josh Silvmans from Pirche, Akuz of America. And, mm-hmm. and I'm running it till today. The uniqueness that I, that I strive with the program, it's run, the day-to-day is run together, Rabbi David Newman, a very talented Rebbe in uh, Lakewood, New Jersey. And uh, the uniqueness is that most programs today are built on, number one, is that they usually end up giving away the cheaper end of things. So they, get, they go to a store, get a donation of whatever the leftover items couldn't sell. So we did right. everything the high end here. Is that if there's a pizza party, the kids get money to buy from the local pizza store. They don't get any, uh, you know, it's, on a nation, it's a nationwide program. So that's one. But the more important part is that the kids, the way it's set up is that it's not, it's, there's no winner or loser. It's not like the best in the class wins something. It's set up right. that every kid who learns for a certain number of minutes a night, that kid earns a point and the most you can learn is for an hour a night. So if someone's smart or, or, or stupid, it doesn't make right. a difference. If you're willing to sit there and put in that hour, you're the same like everybody else. So everyone could win, and that's the same, same, for the same token. The success of the program is that about 80, 85% of all the kids that participate increase their learning 10 to 15 minutes a night just by realizing that they're competing against – they're just realizing they thought they could learn for 15 minutes. And they realize someone else learned 20 minutes. They want that next level of prize. They also could do it, and it's, they could keep moving up. And over the course of time, it's a 10-week program. Runs for the ten toughest weeks, and Baruch Hashem, the reviews are uh, are off the charts. That's a, that's amazing. So they 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 can learn at home, or they have to go to. They learn at matters? home. The way they learn, it's it's any learning with Chavrusa. And since uh, you know, you know, I, I'm coming from a family that you know, my father publishes the Art Scroll series, and my mother, sure. my mother is a, was an early childhood teacher. So I come from a family that's chinuch related. A lot of siblings, and you know, are within chinuch. But you know, being not being not being in chinuch, I defer most of these decisions to the local Rebbe and the local yeshiva. So when kids have uh-huh. detailed questions, where could they learn? What could count? Can my bar mitzvah chazim for my bar mitzvah parasha work? <laughs> Whatever your Rebbe right. says. So there's some rabbeim who let everything and some rabbeim who, you know, in certain, I'm in certain day schools where if they read a book on a gadol, it's called learning. And in other places, right. unless you chazim first, well, you learn in yeshiva, then you can learn other things. And, you know, it's each local. But again, so it's versatile. It's really for every yid. But they're not affecting. It's the reason I'm most able to do this is because I'm not giving 
It's only between me and the school, me and the kid, if there's an issue, because I'm not giving the best kid something. So if I change the rule in one school, it made it easier. It's not fair. Every kid right. who learns an hour gets the same exact, uh, you know, recognition and award and, and uh, things like that. That's fantastic. And this has been going on for, for almost 20 years now, you're it's saying? A little over 20 years. And now, what I did now is, you know, there's a lot of these organizations now online using, utilizing technology, um, you know, whether it's charity.com that has all these campaigns. And you know, sure. I, did, I just had this list a couple of years ago by the Harnof thing to raise, be able to help raise a few million dollars. I remember that. that. I remember or, that. You know, right. Most recently with Orlando, this Orlando helping the, the school buy their building. We're using, you right. talk about crowdfunding. That was, that was, that was, that was in was, Orlando? That was Orlando. That was crowdfunding. That mm-hmm. was crowdfunding there. So, sure. What I basically did now is that for my Megavoa, I'm basically helping. I'm, I'm raffling off a Sefer Torah. Technically, I'm raffling off the money for you to buy the Sefer Torah, but I'm raffling right. off a Sefer Torah from on, by Mas Megavoa, and I'm, I'm allowing every yeshiva and day school in America to partner up, and I'm going to help them raise money, and I'm going to give 75%. So not only do you get a raffle ticket to win a Sefer Torah, but 75% of the, your donation could go to the yeshiva school of your choice. So wow. that's one program we just rolled out now. So I'm trying to like really amass crowdfunding. And you're using technology for this? Like how can people find out about so it? I have, out I, have, their schools? I have a website, masmidgavoa.org that was put up. Okay, and, I'll link to it in the show notes. And uh, someone could go there. But again, now in the process of signing up the schools that want to join. But what I'm doing also is there's four organizations in Kali Yisrael that I know of that focus on kids learning. And one of them is, tar- is chinuch.org from Torah Masora, which helps the Rabbeim with sheets and different things they need. Um, number right. two is Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation. Number three is Pirche sure. Gizrael of America and Avasubanim. And in addition to the money, you could choose which school or schools you want to divide your money or those organizations. I'm giving a, um, I'm dividing up from the first million dollars raised cumulatively from all the schools. I'm going to give 10% to be divided amongst those four organizations. So basically, when you're buying a ticket, wow. you, aside from you winning, you pick who you want to get 75%, and, the, and 10% of that will go out to those organizations. You know, somebody asked me the, 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 the impetus is, I said, if I was raising money, and I was able to be successful to raise a million dollars, I'd have to decide how to give it, where to give it, what to do, build an right. overhead. And I said, my goal is to, to, to have more learning who knows better chinuch than the rabbeim and the principals of the local school? Sure. So instead, just reverse it. Just make it easy. When someone gives a donation, just say which school should get the money, and I'll give the money straight to that principal for him to run a program directly in his school. So the money doesn't go to the school general general fund. It goes to the principal to run any program he he or she wants for their school to they, their school for any type of learning program as an incentive within the school. And they make up the rules. They decide how it gets spent. They just send me the invoice. So I'll tell them, listen, wow. ten thousand was raised in your school. You have seventy five hundred dollars to spend on learning programs. That's amazing. And, and, and so the goal behind this is I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, I guess what I would assume is to really inspire the kids and to get them excited about learning. That's not just being taught and getting grades and it doesn't matter what level you're on, but just being excited about Torah. Correct. So that, that's the massive core thing is to motivate kids to love and learn and learn a little bit more. But if I have the ability now to use crowdfunding and different technologies and, 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 and leverage up relationships to be able to raise money, let me use that, that I think that the Kaichas the Rebbe Shalom gave me to be able to give back and help each organization raise money. So like I'm, I'm absorbing the cost I'm, myself. I'm saying the, 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 when I help out uh, a school, I'll leave them, I'll provide them marketing material and the cost to advertise it. And a dollar comes in, they take 75 cents. So typically most schools can't do a good fundraising campaign because they can't afford to raffle off something big. Now they can pull right. it from all the schools. And even that, That's I'm great. absorbing those expenses, Master So now Master gets its goal. I helps, I help, we more learning programs taking place. And more learning taking place. And uh, the Rebbe Shalom will figure out who gets this chusim. It doesn't have to have the name <laughs> Master Gvoy printed on every kid's flyer when they, uh, when they learn that. Just right. that the learning happens. Beautiful. Beautiful. Fantastic. Really great. Okay, so you were 19 when you started. With just what, like, what made you – was there something that happened to you you said, hey – like how did you come up with the idea to like help kids chazer, you know, the learning from the day to inspire them? What, like a 19 years old – like – I'm just saying, it's like, so, how'd you come up so with that? So basically, I went through the yeshiva system with basically getting like these bases on my report card and wrote Big Belt right. Tishran, you know? And I thought <laughs> back to myself, maybe what happened if I was motivated properly? What motivation uh-huh. could I have done? So as a bacher in BMG, I started by arranging to learn at night with, with kids and creating like a mini incentive program with them. And then mm-hmm. I broadened that by hiring another Rebbe. I had 44 kids the first year. And I always had an eye. During that year, I went around to all yeshivas in New York and, and New Jersey and, and Maryland. And I, I spoke to Manalem what to, to develop the program, to take, to take a program a little national. So I went from that that first year. And I realized to scale it, I had to change a few things. And the next year, we started with 1,900 kids. And then slowly grew over time to a little over 3,000 this past year. So it's open to any school. There's no cost, there's no cost for the kid. 
at all. Right. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, it's having its luck. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. Love it. Okay, so now you're, so you're, now you're, you get married, you're 20 years old, you're in Kolel, after you stay for a couple of years. No, 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 no 11 Virginia. months, 11 months. Oh, 11 months. Okay, so what happens after 11 months? 11 months, I uh, get a job. I get a job working at a firm called Meridian Capital. Okay. It's a mortgage company, and I stay there for four years. Okay. And then four years later, I, I left, and I opened up Eastern Union. So how how do you so I mean I love the name you know now that after the name has been in the market already for so long but it's a it's like the perfect name for this type of uh, uh, you know industry and what you're doing but how did you come up with the original name how did you come up with uh, the initial idea and how did you get the funding to launch your own company so to get the init, the initial idea I was in this business and right. I went I left and I opened up when I started there was it was pretty much I had there was an, there was a uh, friend of the family an attorney that. Um, you know, we thought we need some money to be able to start this business up, and an attorney helped out. Um, and that was actually that attorney's idea. Just came up with the name Eastern Union. And what's funny is that, like, on the first day, second day, I remember working, calling someone up and said, "I'm calling from Eastern Union." For says, "Oh yeah, I heard of you guys," because I think a lot right. of it has to do with you know playing on uh, you know Western Union or whatever. It's just it's a name that you know. The, no, it's fantastic. It's genius. So I that's love it. th- that part. I take no credit, and someone gave me that name. And uh-huh. I basically I took um, I took a one room within within uh, the art school building when I started. Right. I took one room. And it's a sales, it's really a sales organization. So I, I started and, you know, it was a little tough in the beginning because, you know, when, when, when I started, I started totally from scratch. So I didn't, I didn't work on any of the clients I dealt with from before. I didn't work with any of the relationships from before I started. I, I went out and I purchased a, uh, you know, a, uh, there was a, a lead generation book. It was called the blue book at that time. And I just started cold calling. And then as I made cold calls and started doing advertising and, you know, you know Baruch Shem, so, so, so this wasn't you know. handed to you. You actually had a, had a sweat. You had to work. Hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I said I wasn't. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, blessed by uh, by uh, winning a lottery ticket. Lottery, because, you know, <laughs> everything, everything, everything came from like the the club of the nachash. Everything came from work, the hard work, and then the are I'm deciding, and in, you know, deciding when at what time should I see atzlach and where should I have agam snafish. And then Baruch Hashem, you know, you know, as on a net basis, Baruch Hashem, we're doing very well. So when did you when did you realize that hey, this is actually wow, this is actually working out. It's more than just a parnasa, but that you know, you're seeing like really some extra siyat deshmaya. Relatively from the beginning. It's a wow. I, uh, you know, we had its bumps in the roads, but you know, I was, was able to keep an eye on the long view and I was able to see where it's going. So you know, I, I try to always focus on the forest, not just on the trees and the, gra- and the grass. So from the initial stages, you always you always had the dream or the vision to, to build it up. I mean, you have seven offices now? So we have a little less. Um, one second, is it three in New York? It's, uh, uh, I think it's six. But the, the it's about staff of about a uh, staff of about a hundred people. Now we're, in, we're on, now in a very very big hiring mode um, with this mm-hmm. uh, you know with, this, with the app that we rolled out. Um, right. You know I, I always try to focus on you know I had Seattle this way I was focusing on on on, on we, we focused on the business focus on two things is that being number one is a trusted advisor it says no matter what happens in the market one thing a client could always count on us is that what we told them they could count on. So at times mm-hmm. we lost deals because you wouldn't play the sales game where, you know, I knew I could deliver a rate of three and a quarter percent and I would never tell a client three and an eighth and then later on, you know, play the game, retrade him or whatever and hope that it would maybe go down to three and an eighth. I'd always be upfront right. what I could deliver. So I'd always give, give clients advice. They're looking to buy a building and I could really keep my mouth quiet. They're buying it from someone else. They want the mortgage from me. But if I felt it was a bad deal they were buying, I'd advise them that, you know, our thoughts on the business. So the whole culture in the office is a culture of, of, of pure trust. So that was one part, and you know, a lot we, we came with you know with innovation. It's the Adishmai to be able to you know um, have some innovation and be able to see where level the market's going, and hopefully have atzlocha to be able to you know you know you know the muscle that's always given is that someone that's able to you know they, they want to shoot shoot a rocket, put someone on the moon. They're not sitting here and just looking up at the moon and pointing to the moon. They're standing right. there and they're they're angling where's the moon going to be at the time that the rocket gets there. So that was like a right. little bit part of the part of the challenge and is always to like as the market keeps moving to try to be innovative where the market's going to. And uh, over the years, the the good and the bad is that sometimes you bank it right and sometimes you're too ahead of the too way ahead of the curve. So you're spending on things and overbuilding on things that you know the market didn't catch up to you. You know, my father. You know, I remember my father once telling me that when he was started before art school, he was in the invitation business and you know writing subas and invitations and as as soon as a fax machine came out, he was the first one to get one. So the problem is hmm. no one else had one. So no one else had one. <laughs> right, so who was he communicating with? You know, so I felt that that same way over the years as I uh, embarked. But I look back. So you talk about Siat Deshmaya. Is that you look back and I say some of those roads that I went down today 
we, I'm sitting here today with the app and where we think things are on pace to go and Baruch Hashem having, having, having had our best year and the market's up this year for us is that B'derech HaTeva, I cannot have gotten to this point without all the things I went through. So I see, like people say, you see Yad Hashem? Sometimes you see it on a, on a one-minute delay, and sometimes you see it as you go further. Clearly, everything that the world thought I overbuilt, I was ahead of the curve, or I made, made a mistake here, I, I'm getting overcautious or over-optimistic, Baruch Hashem is all coming together at this point. And, you know, as, as, as I'll, I'll get into, I'm um, talking a little bit about the app. Amazing. Yeah, when we, when we, we'll, we'll get to that in, in just a bit, because I definitely want to hear more about that. But just uh, backtrack a little bit. So you said you have about 100 employees. Are, are they all Yidden? Almost all. Come out all. I think that, Come out all. I think that as, we, as we're going to grow now, as we're going to go more on a national basis and get more on, the, on you know, onto it, onto, have, have a division that's focusing on tech, I think that's mm-hmm. where that's gonna, the, the world's going to change a little bit. Right. And so what do you look for when you're hiring somebody? So the first and foremost thing is, 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 is trust. That's the most important mm-hmm. thing. The second thing is passion. Mm. And, you know, and then with that goes things like become like passion is it has someone that has a passion and drive to be successful, to be a student of business where they want to go. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking to hire people that if I'm I, that, you know, I, I learned over the years, I'd rather go. I'd rather go with someone that's considered second, second best in, in talent, but mm. has a better heart and, and a better drive. They can end up further down the line at the end of the day. Sometimes you have certain people who come, like you know, the people pl- play sports, make fun of when this this kid comes onto the court all dressed up in all the, in all the gear. They know he doesn't right. want to play. You know, right. you bring someone that has, doesn't have doesn't have the, the official raw talent. Comes in there, someone has a real drive to want to learn. And then you know, you know, the, uh, one of the koyches that I have, and I try to work on, is being able to train people and coach them to be the best that they could be. Excellent. So you, so you're pretty hands on with your employees. Extremely hands on. That's that's the, the the signature success is that I bring people in for the most part straight out of yeshiva, and I have the to you know to train hundreds of men to to make to be a bal mishpacha and, and be able to support the families and that people that are making millions of dollars a year. So you know people ask me what's the what's the trade secret. I think it's more of a schus to be able to do it, and I think really the right. trade secret is that I try to employ is that I care. I I, I focus. First on what to helping them, and then I'm a byproduct of whatever success I'll get from it. So as when I wake mm-hmm. up in the morning, I don't first say, "Okay, uh, in order for me to make more money, let me hire somebody." When I have someone working here, I focus: how can I bring the best talents out? How can I make them get them to work with other people? It's a byproduct if they're successful, and mission, I'll be successful from that work. But it doesn't go the other way around. So that's why I people, I had people at times that are making more than I was making because right. I want them to be the best they can be. And I came across plenty of people that are better than me. And, you know, I'm able to coach them and work with them and then bring the, the, the best they can be brought out. So that's what I take pride in. On the flip side of that is that, you know, the one critique, if you did research on the company, people tell you that the company is, well, they'll call it a revolving door. And I said, mm-hmm. I don't really focus on the revolving door. I focus on I'm looking to train Olympic swimmers. So mm-hmm. I, I look at it that how many people that I produce had the schuss to train and produce that were able to, to earn millions a year. No other, right. com- no other company in my in my industry from scratch since I in the last fifteen years, I don't know of a single person that came out of yeshiva, took the first job working for a mortgage company, and are today earning seven figures a year or have a net worth of multi millions of dollars. And by wow. and in the office by us, there's more than a dozen such people went at, at, at that type of level. Wow, that's inc- a dozen people in just fifteen. That's incredible. That's more than that today. I'm saying, but if you look at it, the people that right. are making now this year, there's over a dozen people this year earning seven figures that started here, still working here, and I've, I had someone who got a contract, a twelve million dollar contract, to go work somewhere else. Someone wanted, another company wanted to pick them up. So wow, that's the so that's the skills that I had. It got very tough in the market, and that's where you know we're going to talk. Like I said, we'll talk about the app. But the market got very tough for new people to break in. It got much much tougher. So those that mm-hmm. are here are in. And as the market is evolving and changing, but that's uh, that's where things are at now. So uh, the, the the key really is, and I try to tell people the two, you know, if I could use this to say on two points, that someone wants to to build out a great company and, and a sales staff and workers, is you got to treat your workers like an investment, not an expense. Don't look at mm-hmm. it. I could get away. If someone wants sixteen dollars an hour, seventeen. I'm gonna try to squeeze them down to fifteen to seventy-five. I would go for the 17, and if I really felt they should be worth more, I'll pay them more. Because that person walks out and is going to put in so much extra effort into the business, I'll get my return on that extra $2,000 a year I spent. Same thing with commissions. Right. I pay the highest commission. Make them feel good and put energy into them, and then you can be able to grow that business. That's one. And on a lower level, for an individual person, my advice to I tell everyone, individual person, is everybody has str- strengths and weaknesses. Don't look to fix your weaknesses. Look to polish your strengths, but find yourself a partner. 
or or a, a, a partner or someone that you work very well with that could compliment, similar to what you get from marriage. Get an Azer Connect Day. That's the same concept sure. that's over here. So I take someone who's a great talker, terrible in details, partner them up with someone who's great in details, not the greatest talker, but they have a mutual respect for each other's value they bring to the table. Those people as a group will go crazy. Their production go through the roof. Amazing. And so true. And it's funny, just based on what you were saying about employees and investing in employees, I, I, there was this quote you know, that uh, I just seen, I just posted. So the, C, the CFO asks the CEO, what happens if we invest in developing our people and they leave us? And the CEO replies to the CFO, what happens if we don't and they stay? By the way, I agree with that a thousand percent. The <laughs> only problem that I run into on that is by, yes, about having a lot of from people is because then the, you know, my problems, I get too emotionally involved. You know, I'm meeting right. someone, I see the potential and it just frustrates me that I, that, 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 you know, they're not getting it and, not, and try to put too much, sometimes just, you know, you try. Yeah, I, I I love that quote. I saw I saw it so many times. People send it to me all the time. Ah. <laughs> I want just uh, to on that topic. I guess it's a little more of a difficult question, but I guess it must. It, it's hard to let somebody go. I assume if you have to, if you know, knowing that they're from and knowing they're from, fa- you know, they have a family, etc. How do you how do you deal with that? So that, that is the toughest. That's the toughest part of the whole thing. And like you know, I opened up an office a couple of years ago in Israel, and I tell people mm-hmm. that. I opened it with the goal primarily to help and be able to give jobs there. And even though people right. say it's not going to work and 6,000 miles away and et cetera, et cetera, even though with advance in technology, you know, the toughest part is I remember that I took people straight out of, most of the people I hire overwhelmingly are straight out of coal or straight the first job. Right. That's the big key. So in other words, when most companies don't want to hire potential, they want to hire today, I could hire straight from potential. Because I believe mm-hmm. the same competent person, you are as competent today as you were when you first started. You have more experience in life be the same competent. Right. So mm-hmm. I could take someone out of yeshiva and I'm willing to train them from scratch and literally like bring someone in and very, in a short order, get them, you know, again, some of them are making within a couple of years. You know, that, that, the, a lot of these people I'm talking about that are making seven figures, they're making the seven figures in the 20s. They're not like that. Wow. So, and then, you know, a big thing I push them is tzedakahs. I say, listen, if you're not giving a chaymish at that level, you got to at least be giving a chaymish. And I don't collect for any cause. So it's like I encourage them to give to family and how to give to family and give to their back to the yeshivas that help them. Don't just find the new people that know you because now you're making money that start whining and dining you and putting you on a pedestal. Remember those people right. that help you get here, you know? So... It's a car sato. So it's a big part of it's a big part of the car sato. So when it comes to, like I said with Israel, when I had to, unfortunately, it wasn't working for people and let right. people go. You know, I so the, the thank you letters that I got... When I opened, I know it's amazing what you're doing in Israel. You know, it, it paled by comparison to the letters like, I can't believe so you're letting a person go. You have a successful business. What does it cost you to let someone stick around a little bit extra? And in some of these mm-hmm. cases, they were commission only. They weren't even making a salary. And I, I and, and what, what got me to be able to let some of these people go is because I tell them that you, know, you have a mishpacha sitting here. You're not going to make it. If, and once it's real, you're not going to make it. To a certain extent, I think I'm doing them a favor. I, I'll help them go get the next job. And I get letters six right. months later, you know, something full, you know, we very rough when we worked here, it was tough. You had demanding certain details, but you know something, my next job, it paid off. I have companies that call me all the time and said, Ira, who are you letting go now? Because <laughs> I want to hire them. I know if they, they, if they, they went through your boot them. camp, they know how to reply right. to emails, the etiquette of calling and back and forth. They know how to get it done. So do I, do I some people say, do, did I turn over? But listen, if I'm working here for the Brunish Limb, and I'm helping people get a parnasa. It doesn't have to be what's my conversion rate within the office. I look at it that, right. you know, if I did the ishtalis, if they do their job. But the number one reason I could tell people to take jobs that didn't work, I, asked, I do an exit poll. I tell this person, I'm very blunt up front. And I'll tell someone mm-hmm. exactly what it takes to make it. To make it mm-hmm. and doesn't make it. And I tell the person, if you're going to make it in this business, you're going to have to make these mon- amount of phone calls a day, work this way. And then they come in, they do it a different way. So I said, what were they thinking? And their answer always is, Ira, there's no other job that I could take that I, coming out of yeshiva, I could actually see myself making seven figures a year, except here. So I'm, I, can, I think I convinced myself that it's for me. I convinced myself, why not give it a shot? So it's very tough on the way out. I, I have very clear goals with people. So they know exactly where they stand and they know where, it's, where, where things are going to. And they know in advance they have to hit a certain target by a certain date. And if they don't hit that target, then it's not going to work. So the smarter ones see that they're about to hit they the wall they and, they, and they quit. And like I advise them, quit early. So when they go to the next job, they can walk in and say, listen, I went to work for Eastern. You know, I went as the first job. It's a training ground. I real, I, they would have kept me on a little bit longer. I realized it wasn't for me, but I gained a lot of experience and I want to take it to my next career. You have the highest rate of getting hired in the next place because someone sees, whoa, this is a good person, took a job, tried it, realized on their own it wasn't working, stepped left, and now I could hire someone with some level of experience. 
And I think that's that's what the uh, best of the group went on to using it that way. But it's very, very tough. And um, right. that's, those are the toughest things that I had to deal with. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it comes with uh, part of business. Part of business. Uh, right. But I'm sure it's done. I mean, the, uh, it goes without saying, I'm sure you do it in a mental, mental kind of way. But, you know, the, the answer to that question is, I can tell you, the answer obviously is yes. And you think that right. you do in the most mental way. And I have a committee of people that I talk to. And I, I surround myself not by yes, yes people who say whatever you say, but more people right. that are blunt and answer back. But I learned the long way. When someone thinks they're doing a good job or you're delivering bad news, there's really no way to deliver. There's no good way to deliver bad news. I could call you right. today at 2 o'clock in the morning and tell you, that you won the lottery. You're not upset no matter because of how I called right. you. But if I Why you wake me up? Well, you couldn't wait till six. Right, if I, but if, you know, they say when you fire someone, only fire them on this day of the week and on that day of the week. I learned there's no good day. There's never right. a good time. The only thing I tried, which I learned from someone to give over, is that if you, if you really know it's not going to work. Let them know sooner than let later. Let them know sooner. And the fact you let them know sooner. See, this is, the, this is if I could go off on a little bit of a tangent. But for this yeah, please. Point, no, it's for, the, it's, it's a, for this point is that what ends up happening is you notice – January first, it's not working. But you, right. but you want to try with that worker. You don't. You want to. You know, maybe it's going to change. So you go into into another month. Then you go into another month, and then you meet the person. And, they, and they, 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 then it's right before Yontif. So you have to wait till after Yontif. And the problem right. is, by the time you have an opportunity, you just end it, and you're so frustrated, you barely even have enough money or anything to give them more than I don't even know any notice. It's over. A week later, they don't have a job. Right. I learned, and and what I did on jobs, and when there were salaried positions, I went, and if I noticed in January. I would go yeah. over to like a buyout. Now it's expensive, but I learned that for the person's own self and probably a net overall, I'd go over to the person in January and say, I don't believe it's working. You have a choice. Mm-hmm. Leave now while you think it's still working and it's possible it could work. Because I do think I'd rather hurt myself right. and leave on the better terms. I said, here, let's take four weeks pay. If you leave today, I'll give you four weeks pay. Four weeks notice and two weeks pay. Wow. You know, so, so this way, now I look at it, one end of it, I'm paying the person six weeks when they're not really going to get work from them. But on the other right. side, I probably end up paying three months and total burnout. And then the person says, I worked this hard for you and this is all I get. So right. this Especially way they're very happy. And if they decide to stick it out, then I'm in a situation where they, t- they had that option. So I right. find most people, when you're having the problem, most people are smart enough and jump and take this thing when they realize that you're really serious. Sometimes you don't have this luxury to do it. It's, you know, something happens in a market. But in a normal sense, I try to be very clear. And I learned from, you know, one of the things when I first... I started hiring people. My father says in his office, when he hires someone, he tells them that there's two trial periods. There's a two-week trial and a two-month. Mm-hmm. The first two weeks, either party could stop for any reason. Just it's not for me. After right. two weeks, and really in firing, you could fire at any time. Someone could quit at any time. They're at will. Sure. But the first two weeks, anytime, and then in two months, we sit down again. If there's a gut that's not working, we articulate it, we could end then also. Usually, I find that whatever feeling and gut you have in the first two weeks to two months is usually when something doesn't work out later, the problem didn't work out later. So when I started hiring people, I asked them, if I was working with you for three months or six months, what am I going to find that negative about you in those six months? Let's address it now. Because <laughs> either I can't deal with it, so let's not start. Or right. if I knew up front, manage my expectations. We could figure out a way around right. it. That's great. It's brilliant. So, you know, you touched on this very little, but I wanted to discuss it with you just because I think it's uh, an interesting topic. It's come across, come up on other podcasts uh, in other areas. Um, in terms of education, like how important, uh, I, I don't know, did you go to college? You didn't go to college. The people you hire, I know you said they're straight out of yeshiva. You know, how important is, is uh, you know, I guess uh, further education or college education? So what do you think? Here's the answer to this. You know, I don't know how this gets sliced and diced and, and misquoted <laughs> or quoted or whatever, but here's my. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's, it is a very. Uh, my, uh, my, it's, my, it's updated, my updated view is as follows. First and foremost, as an Orthodox Jew, our job is to establish and have a whole thesis, so to speak, that, uh, that I'm trying to put together. That, and, and I saw from all the people asking me, if people come to you that are making millions, people that should have made millions but have made nothing, what's the, right. what's the tzadashev? What's the bottom line you could say across the board that you picked up? What I learned is that a person's job, he has to establish and I'll be there at And those that do what they believe they're supposed to do, those are the ones that found success. So now let's go back, rewind it. I have people that came in here no college education, and started off with a six-figure job. The first day I hired them, they were started at $100,000. I had other people who came in with some level they, of education. You paid salary or they made in No, 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 salary. Also. I, have, I have in the office with me, you know, probably salaried also, you know, you know, probably about close to 15 people or 20 people that are making over $100,000 salary and a few in the few hundred thousand. It's not just the sales force. There's support staff. There's a whole company, Baruch Hashem. Sure. So some of them started at those types of numbers or started pretty high. Others started at wow. entry level. And what I found is that 
those that went through the yeshiva system and the kolol system and believed with a muna pshuta that what their responsibility during those years were just to sit and learn and do nothing mm-hmm. else and had clear amuna when they got themselves a job and then now I have a job, my job is to work my tail off or whatever they're supposed to do in that job they're doing, mm-hmm. those people had atzlaha. Those that went wow. through school, went through yeshiva and believed that, no, you have to be well-rounded. So I have to know about worldly things, whatever they decided. World, I have to take PCS courses, which I think is amazing that they go to. Right. I have to go watch a Shark Tank. I'm a big fan of Shark Tank. I tell people you watch a Shark Tank and you learn business things. And they believe that and then they did that. Those people had a success. The people that did the opposite because peer pressure, other people doing it, I don't think they need courses, but they went anyway. Or they believed they needed courses, but in their circle of friends, they didn't do courses. Those people right. never had a tzlocha. Hmm. And so you asking about education. I do think it's important to – the curriculum has to change. But I do think that it's important. Where I, I make a joke that, that I hire people straight out of yeshiva. That sometimes they got so bad that even the spell check doesn't pick it up. Or even <laughs> Siri can't recognize your English words. So when – I'm talking to people like they got, they have to learn, you know, just basically, you know, it, it's, you know, we have a calculator today, so you don't have to know math the same way that you maybe had right. no math in the past, but there's some just basic what's going on in the world, some just basic current events, like checking the news, know what's going on at some level and being able to, 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 to read and write, be able to articulate yourself, not forget about any high level of English. Just, you know, mm-hmm. it's like someone your English just shouldn't be, I have gooder English than you. That shouldn't be, you know, that, you know people use that line, a guy walks in, I have yeah. gooder English. And he thinks, <laughs> that, you don't have to have fancy English, just don't say I have gooder English. You know, know at least <laughs> what you could say, you can say it at, at a lower level. So, but education beyond that is all based on, is based on a person and what they honestly believe. So some people believe they should get general education. So there are p- different courses they go to, or different books that they read. And I meet people, right. I'm, yes, I am impressed when I meet someone and differentiator, they come into the room and I'm interviewing 10 people people and have two slots or one slot, I'm going to take someone that was a student of business that try to learn as much as they can. Right. Are you a reader? Um, no. So I'm a, sh- the reason I'm not a reader, I, I read a news glancing at this, but like they say, a shoemaker's kid goes barefoot. My right. father being a publisher, <laughs> I'm not a reader. <laughs> very good. All right. Let's talk about the app because that's, that's very exciting. And, you know, first we'll get into it and I'll ask you some questions about it, but I think it's off the bat, I think it's a genius idea. So I want to, I want to hear, first of all, what is the app? What does it do? Who is it for? And how do, we, how do we get there? So the app is 15 years in the making. The app is oh, wow. all of all the ideas I always had with technology and data and bring it all together. Over the years, I, I wrote systems. That's why I keep track. You know, when I was buying Meridian, I developed their system. When I opened up here, I, I started from scratch. I, I, I developed a system to work from internally, and I attempted to sell it in the open market. And it's even bought by one of the largest brokerage firms in America is using it as their software. But back then, oh. I was they was I was mailing out hard CDs, and a person had to download it with authentication codes and whatnot. And then right. you know, then things went online, and then I built an online uh, version of something. And now with apps, you know. I'm, I'm the first commercial real estate company known to come with an app and do the things that I'm doing. And the app is for every single person that claims to be involved in commercial real estate at any level, has mm-hmm. a use and a need, and it solves a problem that they have now. And that's what the app does. The app does. So what's a, pro- the app, what's a problem it solves? It solves four problems. Go ahead. And before I tell you the problems it solves is that the, the reason why I was able to come out with the app, the cultural decision that I made, so while you're listening to the problems and it's solving, is that I see what the newest tech that's coming into the industry, because I have a company and people pitch me what sure. services I could buy. And I see venture capital where they're putting their money. And yeah. I made a decision I always questioned years ago, how come when Netflix came out, didn't mm-hmm. Blockbuster just you know, come out with the same product and knock them out? Sure. Why didn't when the iPhone was Kodak out, also same Kodak? You have iPhone to the Palm Pilot. Why didn't right. you know you know Sprint? You know you have a Kano phone or Sprint to AT and T. How come they, right. they didn't lower the pricing? So the reason Blackberry. is BlackBerry also now. The yeah. reason is because the old regime discounted the new company and said, eh, it's not going anywhere." Yeah. And by the time it went somewhere, they also had to give up some money. So now, in my office, about a year ago, two years ago, I put a cap on the on the fees that we charge. Because I saw the market changing and I put a fee, cap, I capped fees. And, you know, we were interviewed by the Wall Street Journal and the Wall Street Journal did research. And he came back to me and goes, I'm convinced that the market's changing, like you are from speaking to all your competitors. Because usually when I 
speak to your competitors and ask them at the other side of the story, the answers they come back to me and they start knocking you and say different things that the world doesn't know about you. But over here, no one was knocking you. The only knock was, why are you telling the world that the market's changing? Whoever doesn't know, <laughs> let them still pay with the paying. So when we, when we capped our fees, we saw where the market's heading to. This, this second quarter this year, Baruch Hashem, we were up 36% our production over, th- over last year's second quarter when the rest of the industry is flat or down. Wow. So it's a culmination of a lot of things together. But I made a decision. I'm not going to allow Uber. I'm not going to allow myself. I coined it, call it. I don't want to be Uberized out of my business. I don't want to be Netflixed out of my business. And if I have mm. the greatest technology internally and the greatest staff and the most trusted source that we are, and we're the second most active in transactions in America today and on, on the debt side, I'm not going to allow some tech guy. So when I started seeing some of these tech companies coming and I finally saw one person had an idea where it's possible if they got the right traction, it could keep making a dent. I said, if that's the case, I had a meeting with the whole company and I made a cultural decision. My cultural decision is, is that whatever is available publicly, that you could have your secretary without any real estate experience get you the answers, even if it might take her an hour or three hours, or she might have to pay $100, literally just like little money in the scope of a real estate deal, I'm going to give it to you for free, live, instantly. That's the wow. cultural change that I made. And that's why the app is taking off very fast. And I'm, I'm hiring 25 people now. I'm, I'm, I'm right now, I plan on ramping up over the next few months to hire, have teams under them spread throughout the whole United States. So wait, before so now I'm going to tell you what it good. is. Yeah, right. Uh, owner has four, a real estate person has four needs. Okay. They have a need to be kept in the loop what's going on around them. They need news. They have a need right. to find out what rates are going on in the marketplace, what banks are lending at. They have a need mm-hmm. for all different types of calculators. They have a need to get contact information. Someone meets me at an event, remembers my name is Ira from Eastern, doesn't remember my last name, it doesn't have my phone number. How does he get it? Right. I'm talking to a banker. How do I get the person's other number? There was, a, there was an assistant, how to get the number? I need a sales broker, a leasing broker, another mortgage broker. How do I get this information? So the app does these four things extremely well. Very clean, very easy, no password, nothing. There's no barrier to entry. You want it? Go online, go to the App Store, go to the Google Play Store, type in Eastern Union, come up the top of the list, same name as my company, you download it. And so I have no, I, I have I no know the answers to this, but, but why are you doing this? Like why so you I'll, think you build the app, you keep it for yourself. So I'll, 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 I'll t- I mean, I know the answer, but I, I think I know the answer. I'm going to give you the answer to you different, a little bit different than I'm able to say, you know, when I get an interview in the New York Times. But right, before, okay. the, right, so what, the app, what the app does, just to explain the four things, it has a data feed of every real estate news story that's published. Plus, if I get an, their email blast that news places send out, I have one person that's what they do the whole day between technology and live. They filter those stories and they flag it. And then, then someone who downloads the app could start filtering which markets they're in, what they want. So you, know, you just click a button news, there's a news feed. Number two, when it comes to the rates, what's publicly available is what the government bonds are trading at. But what's Man. not publicly available, you have to call up each bank, Fannie Mae, what are your rates today? Freddie Mac, what are your rates today? And I aggregate because I have a team in my office that all they do is quote deals out in the marketplace. A data feed from their work, straight to the app. Wow. So you see the rates. When it comes to the contacts, I put all my bank contacts and third-party vendor contacts public. So there's Come nothing on. I have in my office that's not online. The only difference is because I don't have permission, so I didn't put the cell phones at the bankers. So uh-huh. if you know that I'm dealing with a guy, Joe, at a certain bank, and not only that, you don't even know if his name is Joseph or if his name is John. With, yes, you know, any, right. No, no, well, that's that you know. You're going with the English name there. You could type right. J-O into the search, space, the first few letters of his bank, and as you type his bank, it will narrow down the search to every every person at that bank that has the – J-O in the name. And then it'll come up wow. all the Josephs or Johns or Joe and you'll be able to click on it and dial an email. No barrier to entry. The other part it does is the calculators. I put, I put calculators that don't exist by people don't have it on apps for sure. There's no app. People in their office, not everyone has it. Like a person buying a building, what's it worth? What, what are the numbers you have to plug in? It tells you the value. What, what, what is the cash and cash return? The IRR, the interest only. What does the prepayment penalty calculate today? All the calculations I put up there online. And we're consistently d- developing this app on a basis. So the answer, why did I do it? I made a decision that f- this is pure advertising. And that's if right. everyone in the street, and I found that my competitors are using it now. If everyone in my street. Of course, street, that's what, of course they're going to download. But, everyone, but my clients also. If everyone in the street, I'm less than 1% of the market. And if everyone in the street is using my app, the branding, I could shift my advertising budget from advertising in this newspaper and that website. Have, how much better could it be than on your phone 
phone. I, I met I, I met this, uh, this this billionaire the other day. I'm sitting in his office and he t- and he, he I start showing him the app. He goes, no 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 no, put it on my phone because if it's not on my <laughs> phone, I'm not going to find it. He goes every morning. He's not he's not he's not religious. He goes every morning before I put on Tifflin, I'm going to check the news and the rates. You know, so that reaction from everyone who sees it is was blown away with your question. What's the catch? The catch is phase one. Well, this is pure advertising. A hundred percent. That's what I. That's pure what advertising, I and it's going viral. That's in the commercial space. So we open. It's less than a month out. We just starting to advertise it in the last couple of days. Before it's, it's basically close to two thousand downloads already. We just started, and there's no wow. You, know, you can and almost every every except for one we got humanized. Is that every 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 uh, rating has been a five star except for one a four star. So that's where we're at, mm-hmm. and that's the first thing it does. The second thing it does with very very high security is that the broker in my office, when they use it, they could log in, and on the road they have all their deals, all their contacts. Or their CRM, they have their quotes. Everything is live in the transaction. So when their client calls them up from, oh, so that's just for your, that's just for people in Eastern New York, right? And the third step of the app, which is also going to be free, and this is already built now, and that's why I'm hiring the staff to help it set up, is that any single person related to real estate anywhere, the truth is, it could work anywhere in the world, but I'm focusing on America. If you're an owner of real estate, a lender, um, but in the second, in in the second phase, I'm giving it to my bankers also. So I do a deal with a banker; he could put a quote in. Or he or she could put a quote in live, and I could see wow. it's live. So the third step is that anyone could could send me a list of the properties that they're either they manage, they own, they're a partner in. And the, with this app, when they get, a, I'll give them a login. They'll see the same four features everyone else sees, plus they will see a list of their properties in a beautiful list. So it's really public uh. information in real estate. But I don't. I have no reason to find that the properties you own. But if you give me the list of the properties you own and manage, I'll link you to those properties. Very high security, and you could log in and see a list. You have a nice list. No one has a list of their properties. I met a real estate owner who owns hundreds of properties. He has no list of his properties in the office somewhere. He could get it. He has no access. On phone. <laughs> so, but with that, with that, if you're a client of mine, yeah, this is the competitive advantage. I'm going to have online brokerage that you'll be able to track full transparency. That's where being a trusted advisor is key. Everything is open. Since I'm not lying, I could let everyone else know what everyone else is seeing and going on only on that deal so that I can have a way with like a WhatsApp type chat with a banker, the client, and the broker could all communicate the same way. So whatever wow. I see on my deal with security, that client sees only on his deal with certain wow, rights wow, with the wow. banker. So that's – let's say you, have online, you go to Chase Online Banking. So the monetization, what came up is that you know, I'm hiring the staff and I'm paying 75% away, giving it back to the staff I'm hiring is because yeah. – there are many owners, once they started seeing it, they told me, Ira, once I have this list in front of me, I would love it if I could store, link my, some of my documents here. I get an email every day from my secretary with certain numbers. I wish you could just post the page properly and I see, it, I see it here. I would like to link who my, who my uh, super is and who the different vendors on in case of emergency link to my properties. I would like right, to wow. have manage it, sync it to here. So then 15 seconds, you could reach any part of your business. So I told him, I said, listen, for that, I said, basically, I said, listen, what I'm prepared to do is... Two things. One is, let's say you want to build a digital bridge from your management software to this app, so the app could read the story for you. Right. You don't want to spend three thousand dollars that it costs to build. You just want to spend right. five hundred. I'll try to put together five other owners, my tech team, that also probably want the same thing as you do. You could build an API build to, an API, to the right. existing. Build like a, like an API a digital bridge. I build an API right. to all Love all it. six, and now the seventh person says, "Oh, I want that also." I can tell the seventh person, "No problem." For ten dollars a month, you oh, know, okay. the, the first three covers the cost. Ten dollars a month uh-huh. to give you access, but every person what once if you pay ten dollars a month, I will let an owner click on any individual deal and start linking all different things that any other owner chipped in and did. So, like, let the real estate community, you know, merge functionality. So, I'm not going into property management. I'm not going into a way for tenants to pay. I'm not doing any of those things. But I'm going to allow right. for if you already have some technology, build APIs, and then all the other clients of that company could build it. So the next thing I'm building, one owner wants me to build now, is, a, is communicate with his tenant. No owner has a way to communicate with the tenant. I'll give each tenant an app. They could sync to that building, apartment 3B. So now right. the tenant could put a maintenance request in. Or the landlord could say, hey, we're paving the drive with a parking lot on Tuesday. Please uh, park on the other side. Send a message. All that can get notification through an app. Wow. So this idea wow. is where it's going to branch out. But what's the core? It's all called Eastern Union. So hopefully it's branding. And if someone's using my app, my app, that they, you know something? Let me give Eastern a chance to, uh, sure. to work that transaction. So and that's how you go national. So that's the, I'm, we're a national company now, but that's where we're going to start. You know, going to get people to download it the free part. But the cool part is, again, economy to scale is that I'm in the process of making a deal with a company that will provide its public information 
So that's the whole thing over here. Every single thing is public information when it comes to real estate. People don't realize it. They, they think it's hidden. If, if, you, if, if, if I'm willing to spend the money, I can get everything, find that information about every building a person owns, even if it's in an LLC name, because there's, there's, there's programs that could tell you who owns that LLC. Everything is right. recorded somewhere. So what I ended up doing is what's going to really be a huge help for these owners is that, is that I'm going to allow them to put onto their properties. If I have every, I'm buying a database of every single property that closes in America as it closes. Raw data. And wow. if you give me the, if, when an owner is going to look at his 10 properties he owns, I'm going to give him a notification when something closes in a one mile radius. So an owner could be driving home and also his phone buzzes. He opens it, the building next door just closed. So he knows what his deal's worth. He knows his activity going on in his neighborhood, number one. Wow. Number two, I'm going to allow sales brokers that are selling real estate for free, again, because all this is to get advertising and, you know, have, you know I'm like sure. the go-giver. If I could help, there's a book called The Go-Giver. Is you help someone, and then, like I said, let me help them first, and then hopefully, you know, we get the payback. So I go to a sales right. broker and say, if you're selling properties, if you tell me the addresses, which is public, and you give it to me in some digital format, what I would do for you is I will notify everyone that owns real estate within a one-mile radius. So now, but think about it for my clients now. What the attraction is, if you download my app for free, you don't have to put any password in. If you want to track your deals for free, you want to have a nice list of your deals, I'll give you a list and I'll track for you your live balance of your mortgage, what the live prepayment penalty is, what was for sale in the neighborhood, and what closed recently. And in New York, there's a company called Jack Jaff and Associates, which is to my knowledge, the largest they get rid of, help people get rid of violations. They fight the city for violations. Is that right. he has a data feed he's providing to me, to provide to everyone free as well of how many violations they live have on the building. So this is the foundation for free. I'm hiring a staff that if someone wants to now pay for customization or different things, you could do that. And I'm giving away 75% of the commission to the staff that I'm hiring, so they could keep bringing people on. So someone who's now someone who's looking to get into the real estate business, the mortgage business is tough. So you want it, you want a chance to get a break into the business here. Promote the app, bring the app to people, wow. see what vendors you could sell, what APIs, find some vendor that wants to put an API on, see what deal you could strike with them, and you keep 75%. If it goes great, you know, hopefully on the ground floor, what I hope to be a multi billion dollar business. So if wow. that goes from there, I'm doing yourself. Well, personally, I think $10 a month is a little uh, inexpensive. Because you know why? I'm looking, yeah. I only need the money to do two things to pay the sales staff, the thousand people I want throughout the country to, to deal with that, everybody. And right. B is, there's some development I want to keep doing because my app never ends being developed. There's going to be ongoing development. Yes, yeah, so that's that quarter. Sure. More than, so then I don't need the money for that. The rest of my mortgage business, I want this whole thing to be a marketing for my mortgage business. So if everyone's using the Eastern Union app and right. living you're gonna, you're, you're, your business should right, so I'm hoping increase. I'm to double or triple over the next couple of years. Zerat Hashem. Zerat Hashem. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Ira, you're blowing me away. Really fantastic. I'm so inspired what you're doing. You've already given so much of your time. Just a few more minutes. I just want to ask you a couple more, you know, what we call our lightning round questions. I know my listeners are definitely going to love this episode. So why don't you tell, what is the best advice you ever received? So, you know, I thought it's, I don't really rank it as best. It's just a lot of things at different times, you know, in different situations have best advice for those situations. But the one thing I try to, uh, that I think I, I heard, I don't remember who I heard it from, and I try to always give over is to live for today without sacrificing tomorrow. Make a decision today. You have two offers in front of you. Make the one that's best for today and you don't sacrifice tomorrow. So if you have a job to come into the mortgage business and another job to have an opportunity to chaperone a certain person you want to you work with and the mortgage mm-hmm. and, and live for today, which one works today? But if one of them, if you can take one of them, the other one won't be around in a few months, but the other one will, you can make, make it work. Take the one that's for today without sacrificing tomorrow. Don't do a move that can sacrifice tomorrow. So what you're saying, not to be so risky? Not such risky. It, you could take risks, but as long as the risk yeah. is not going to knock you out. So if you have two right. choice, one choice is going to give me one choice is going to give me a level eight, and it's a stable eight, and one choice is going to give me a ten. But if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be living the rest of my life at a six. Go for the eight. Right. So live for today. Work. You could live at eight. If you can't live at eight, you have no choice. But as long as you can right. live at eight, take the eight because that's a stable way to go. But take Love a risk. If the, if the negative, what's the worst case scenario? So someone comes to me and says, I'm quitting my job. I, heard, I want to take this opportunity. I ask a person, you're quitting your job, you want to take this opportunity? Before you do that, I just want to make sure, what happens if my opportunity didn't work out? It's, not, it's no big deal. I'm earning $50,000 now. I could for sure get a job at 50. No problem. Take the risk. But if you're earning $150,000 now, in a position that if you left, you couldn't get that back and you only get a $100,000 job and you need 120 to live, even though you think that working in the mortgage business, you, you might one day be able to make millions, don't take that right. risk. Hmm. 
That's great. I, I mean, and it, it, it's similar to, you know, people come to me for uh, startup advice all the time. I say, listen, until your startup is making money or you get the right investment, I said, don't give up your day job. Correct. You always got to make yeah. sure that your basics are paid for and taken care of. Father, but that, that now you know why I answered to you. There's a lot of different pieces of advice for different scenarios. But one thing that's uh, across right. the board is live for today without sacrificing tomorrow. What you just said is the same theme under that umbrella. You know, in each right. area is that same theme. Excellent. All right. Do you have a uh, what piece of advice would you give to a front entrepreneur that's just getting started? Not not necessarily in, in the uh, in mortgage brokering, right. but so in I, any industry. So it's again the same theme: live today without sacrificing tomorrow. And number two is don't just focus on all the what ifs when you're going to make money and then have a, an issue or a fight or whatnot when how it's going to work when you're making the money. Focus on the downside. Focus on what could go wrong and make sure you're hedged for the downside. So some people go into deals where they have the ability to make money and they, focus, they spend all their energy of what if we make a million dollars and 10 million, 100 million, a billion, and what do we do? Has, and why if I make a billion, then do you still get this money? They spend all the time. And then he gets them one question. What happens if you don't get a customer? Oh, we're for sure going to get a customer. Put your energy <laughs> on the down, number one. Number two, right. it's like I said before, it's, I call it the make whole. Find a partner or a high enough paid employee that's going to be like your Azer Connector. That if you're amazing at big picture, find the detail-oriented guy as your partner. If you're amazing at details, find the big picture. You're not that personable. You're not that outgoing. Find the opposite. What's your weakness? Don't try to change it. You're never going to change. You're never going to be that person. Can I sit by a desk the whole day and do a deal if I have to? Like one of the things my dad told me when I started the business, there should be nothing in my business that I can't do myself. So if everyone walked out the door tomorrow, I could do every part of the process. And that's the same thing my dad when he built his business. There's no part of the process that he can't do himself. So now... Do I want to do this type of work? No. So the first person I hired was to do the work that I'm the worst at. And I found someone that's amazing at that and love doing that. So I meet people who love sitting by a computer all day. That's what they love to do. I couldn't do it the whole day. So on and so forth. Right. Excellent. Excellent advice. A couple of uh, fun questions. What have you purchased recently for less than $100 that had the greatest impact in your life? So I can tell you this. As an as a Orthodox Jew, obviously, it's, it sounds like it's a pro- promo to my father. It's not, <laughs> but I say. bought actually well, a gift is that, uh, li- the book Living in Muna. And, I, oh, and yeah. I read it every Shabbos, a Yant of Suda, one thing by the table. Wow. And I try to give it out that every, every event when I hire people, company events, and that's the thing that changed. That was the biggest thing I think that changed my life and it let me go to take on other things that I did. And the free advice, which is very tough, and those of you that are in sales for sure, is that someone told me years ago it was a big change for me, is that I stopped taking out my cell phone during davening. So the time davening starts till it ends, I don't even look at I don't even look at it. And you know, the decision really that made is that like I think like someone pointed out that you go to a business meeting and you're at that business meeting and you're hoping to be mitzachin by the person and they should give you a deal and who has the ability to control that whole meeting? So when you finally get davening for a total of cumulatively, I don't know, at max two hours a day, an hour and a half, right. an hour, whatever the, however long a show you're davening, and I don't take out a look at my phone during that time at all. No exception. And Fantastic. that was a big change. I love that. I love that. I, 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 I want to make sure it's very clear yeah. so those who know me make the joke. Outside that, it's every other You're second. on your phone. <laughs> every second. I, I, I sometimes <laughs> check my emails faster than the auto comes in. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right, what is something you believe in that others, that others think is insane? You could, teach, you could teach anybody anything. If someone has a, wants to learn something, you could teach them. So most people, this is, like, this is what I got my, from my mom. You look at someone, you, she says, take the best you can take out of them. When I meet someone, I don't just look at them where they are today. I look at where they could go. And, and if they want to passionately go, you could teach them to get there. So the story is, the story of life is I meet these new brokers straight out of yeshiva. And the guy said, hey, this guy's wasting your time. And meanwhile, he turns out to be the biggest superstar down the line. And, awesome. and uh, so you teach anybody anything if they have a drive. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, one last question. And that is, when you hear the word successful, who do you think of and why? Um, my dad. Ah. And, um, you know, for me, Baruch Hashem, that, that, that's an easy question, easy answer, and easy reason. <laughs> uh, you know, you have the, is able to accomplish things that, uh, you know, game changed the world. So it's like. It's true. It's true. It's, it's, it's you know, you have, he, he, mom has changed the world. This, this listen that the hands uh, and everybody at our school has is just unbelievable. I remember I once had a, a meeting with uh, Schottenstein in, uh, in Cle- Cleveland. Or was it? I think, yeah, in uh, Columbus. And, I bought a suit, like I bought a new suit to meet him. And someone asked me, he says, oh, you're going to try and impress him? I said, no, I'm actually, I'm buying this suit because I have so much covered for what he did for, for Gemara learning, this generation. That's for the covered Torah that I'm buying the suit. 
And obviously the same thing could be said about your father and uh, anybody at art school, anybody that spreads Torah like this is it's just, you know, I, I, you know, I, just, I just hear, I, I hear that I, it's, it's very impressive. I think that too. So you have to also make sure to balance that. that the next time you go meet your Chaim Kanievsky, you put on a suit, also, a new suit. Oh, a new suit. Yeah, that's true. You know, I guess because living in Eretz Israel, you take it for granted maybe, too. So you know, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, Reb Chaim is. I've I've changed two of my kids' names because of Reb Chaim. I mean, listen, that's it. It's, it's uh, you get it's, it's all from the Gedolim. That's it, uh, 100%. All right, Ira, this has been absolutely unbelievable. I thank you so much for your time. It was really great uh, getting to know you myself personally and, you know, I'm sure my listeners as well. So, you know, continue Hatzlacha and Mazel, especially with the uh, the Torah programs that you're really behind. That's that's really fantastic. And you should uh, just continue to be much clearer. Thank you. And I want to just end with um, it's something like I put on each, you know, each end of it that if there's anyone that has, you know, if they think I could be of help with a question or connect them to somebody and they feel free to uh, call me. My, I'll, I give them, I'll give them my cell number and my email. I go through every email every single day. I, I go to sleep at night with zero unread emails and uh, an inbox that has wow. usually less than 10 emails left in it. So my email address is Ira Z, I-R-A-Z, at Eastern, the letter U, and the letter F, dot com. So it's Ira Z at EasternUF.com. And my cell number is 917-597-2197. And if I can help someone ideas how to help them grow their business and, you know, the drivers of the giving pronounce to other people as well, that's my, my added motivation. So that's, that's I can't people. believe you just did that. That's awesome. I just had uh, in my, my last episode. I had uh, this guy, Dimitri Salita, who is a, a you know, professional boxer from a uh, boxer and boxing promoter. And uh, I asked him if he knew uh, this guy, Floyd Mayweather. You know, as a joke, if he had his number and he says he actually does, but he didn't give it to me. Uh-huh. Well, I, I, I didn't give you someone else's number. I gave you mine, you know. That's true. That's true. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> okay. Ira, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll uh, get you on again, hopefully one day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. Call it to Thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nahum Kligman. We hope you learned something valuable. And we'll-